So we're going to hear um, James talking about um, can we be morally good without Jesus? That's a wonderful question and here's a chance for James to introduce himself. Mm, thank you. Uh, so I, I've been around Oxford for the last roughly 17 years. Um, I studied here and then I continued in research and stuff. So um, I have been to this sort of group once before, but it's, it was a while ago. So it's a real privilege to, to speak to you um, this afternoon. So it's an interesting question we've got here today. And um, what, I, what I'd like to do to start with is distinguish between what is morally right and what is morally good. Now, that, that might sound like a, um, uh, like a trivial distinction, but you, you, could, you could think of it in this way. I don't always get things right, but I'm still a good person. And that, that, there's, there's a difference between getting things right and being good. Um, Oh, oh, there's an interesting verse in the Bible which distinguishes right and good uh, in, an, in a quite unexpected way. The verse says, one will hardly die for a righteous man, though perhaps for the good man, someone would dare even to die. It's a strange thing to talk about dying for somebody, but, but dying for a righteous man, no, nah, people wouldn't do that. For a good man, they might. Well, what's that exactly mean? Uh, righteousness or rightness is about keeping all the rules. And we probably already all know people who are, who are sticklers for kind of keeping the, the, strict, the strict letter of the law. I mean, like speed limit, keeping the speed limit can be very annoying. Uh, and you can, uh, it, it rarely makes you a nice person when you're keeping to all the rules. It, it's just a certain mindset you have. And also it means you get quite offended when other people don't keep the rules. But uh, a, a really good illustration, probably the best I know of, of this distinction between right and good is Les Miserables. I don't know if you know that story. Most people know the story. There's a great musical about it. Um, but the story is really, uh, it, it, it focuses in on the constant struggle between uh, the, the righteous uh, police inspector, Javert, and the good ex-convict, Jean Valjean. And, and they're just battling it back, back and forth, all the way through the story. And, and it's, a, it's really looking at what it means to be good as opposed to keeping the laws strictly. I mean, technically, Valjean should be back in prison. He escaped from prison. But uh, actually, he's a good person, and shouldn't, shouldn't, that, shouldn't that matter? And eventually, at the end of the story, uh, towards the end of the story, Javert, whose life has been saved by Valjean, then uh, captures him, finally manages to capture him, um, but Valjean is in the midst of doing an act of wonderful kindness and goodness for somebody else, for Marius. And so he pleads with him, just let me go, and he's taken back to his, his, this dying man, back to his grandfather. And Javert, whose life has been saved by him, feels, well, one good turn deserves another. I mean, maybe it's right to let him go, but then, but then I have to send him to prison, and he's just so torn and conflicted over this, he throws himself into the river and dies. Uh, he kills himself because he just can't deal with this. It's the, it's the, the distinction between right and good. So it's, it's interesting. Um, and ultimately, goodness defeats strict righteousness. That's the message of the story. Now, Jesus, there's a, there's a story from the career of Jesus as well, which uh, illustrates this distinction. Uh, there was a rich young ruler who came to Jesus and Obviously, Jesus is a teacher, a wandering teacher, and so he's the person to ask all your hard questions to. And so this rich young ruler says, good teacher, what must I do to obtain eternal life? Now, Jesus knows he's actually asking, what must I do, as in righteousness, what, what rules do I have to keep? But Jesus actually flips it around and says, it's not about righteousness, it's about goodness. He picks up on what that man started with, which is good teacher, what must I do? And obviously, the, the, teacher, the, the rich young ruler wasn't meaning anything particularly by good teacher. He was just a mark of respect. But Jesus says, uh, wait, 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 what do you mean by good? No one is good except God alone. You think, okay, well, fair enough. Um, but that's not really an answer to the question. And, and then Jesus says, okay, let, let me answer your question. The answer to the question is, well, keep the Ten Commandments. That's what, what is required. That's um, what must I do to obtain eternal life? What does God require? And now, obviously, we all, we all heard about the Ten Commandments. I don't know how many of us would be able to uh, list them off. 
I've got a little song I go through. My, my, my brother sang in a, a, child, a children's musical. But, um, but even with the Ten Commandments, if you just take the easiest parts of the Ten Commandments, I wonder what, how we would um, do if we were tested according to this exam. Um, how many of us have murdered? Well, I, I hope nobody in this room has, has done that. Oh, yeah, Malaya, maybe. Um, <laughs> um, adultery or sex outside marriage? Well, it's possible there might be some of that in this room. Who knows? Uh, OK, but, but still, maybe some people said, no, I, I've been faithful in, in relationships. OK, what about stealing? Have you ever stolen? Well, it kind of depends on how you define stealing. It wasn't really stealing. Oh, I don't know. Maybe, maybe, maybe I have done. Um, what about lying? Well, I mean, who hasn't lied? I mean, white lies. I mean, how do you define lying? Some lies are OK if it's in the right context. And, well, you could, I mean, let, let's think about moral righteousness in that sense. What does it mean to be right? What, what are we keeping these laws? Actions, actions, you could argue actions are morally ambiguous. In fact, just on Wednesday, I was speaking to a, a friend of mine who's a, uh, a recently graduated from Brooks, and he was explaining how when he was 14 years old, he crashed his mum's car. Oh, I think that's, that's not good. That's definitely going to breaking the, the commandment to honor your father and mother. Uh, but he then said, well, the context was I was driving with her, she was driving, and she blacked out at the wheel. And so I, I had to do something. I, mean, I couldn't can take over the steering wheel. I basically just stayed off the road crashed it, it was, it was un, un, unusable after that, but at least she was safe. Oh, okay, in that case, so it, the action itself is ambiguous, morally ambiguous. It depends on the context, and particularly on the motivation for the action. I mean, you could imagine pushing, um, pushing an old woman over in the street. That, that sounds like a bad thing, but if she's in the way of oncoming traffic, that might be a good thing. So most actions, you could argue, are morally ambiguous. Kind of, are they right or wrong? Well, it's the, the issue is not so much the action, it's about the motivation that matters, why you're doing it. Uh, and, and so actually, Jesus picked up on this. He said, you may have heard, I mean, referring back to the Ten Commandments, you may have heard it said, don't murder anybody. Well, I say to you, don't even be angry or hateful towards somebody. Because if you're hating somebody, you've already murdered them in your heart. The motivation is the same if you hate somebody or if you murder them. So really, I mean, in God's eyes, hatred is, is bad enough. It's equivalent to, to death penalty or, or murder. Um, what about lust? You've heard it said, don't commit adultery. Don't sleep with somebody who's not your wife. But I say to you, whoever even looks at someone else with lust has already committed adultery in their heart. Well, I mean, that, that really changes the, the question. I mean, who hasn't? Uh, committed that sin. So in that sense, if it is about motivation rather than about the action itself, then really it comes down to conscience, doesn't it? What, what is morally righteous? Well, it depend, we know deep down in our hearts, we know what's right and wrong. And, and, and none of us have, have been perfectly right. Now, it's interesting, the rich young ruler, his response to Jesus when Jesus said, so, um, well, keep the Ten Commandments. That's the way to obtain, attain, obtain eternal life. That's doing righteousness. And the rich young ruler said, actually, ever since I was a youth, I've kept them all. Now, that's actually technically true. Legally, he was righteous. He'd not break, broken any of the laws technically on, on, in terms of the actual action. He could say, yes, yep, all of my father and mother, yeah, I've always kept the Sabbath. I've never m murdered, never committed adultery never stolen, never lied, and so on. So then Jesus turns it around and says, well, well, actually, before that, the rich young ruler said, I've done all that, but what else is there? Now, that's really interesting. He recognized it wasn't just managing to keep all the laws, because he, he knew that wasn't enough. He knew there must be something more. I don't feel like I've got eternal life. I don't feel like I've kind of, I'm, I'm living that fulfilled, satisfied, kind of purposeful life hopeful life, the, kind of the fullness of, of what we are designed to be, there's, there's still something lacking. Even though I've been righteous, there's something more. He was really asking about that goodness side of it. So Jesus then turns the question over to goodness. He says, okay, well, there is something else you can do. What you need to do is sell all of your possessions. Remember, he was a rich young ruler. 
give all the proceeds to the poor, not to your parents or your friends, whatever, and then come follow me and learn from me how to be good. Now that, that's, that was, that's a, a big ask for somebody, particularly somebody who's got all the family responsibilities of, of all of your property and all that. And the rich young ruler couldn't do it. He turned around and walked away. And it says Jesus looked at him and loved him and said, sell all you have, give it to the poor, you'll get rewards in the life to come, and then come follow me. So being good is harder than being right. Goodness, moral goodness, is harder than moral rightness, righteousness. So how do we define moral goodness then? Well, I think we could probably all agree that the ultimate moral goodness is love. I mean, we all know that, that kind of being loving is the, is the, the best expression of goodness. And Jesus himself said that when he was asked, what's the greatest commandment? Now, in, in, in Judaism, in Jewish law, there are 613 commandments. I mean, the, the rich young ruler, was, was, he, he knew all those. He, he could say, yep, yeah, check, 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 check. But Jesus said, well, the whole of the law, all of the, all of the right laws can be summed up in just two, two expressions. First one is, love the Lord your God with everything you are, with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your strength with your resources. And the second one is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. If you just do those things, you'll have kept the entire law. That's, I mean, that's pretty simple. Love God, love others. That, that should be fairly straightforward. And, and if that's the ultimate expression of righteousness, Jesus is saying that's also the ultimate expression of goodness. Same thing. Love is the ultimate. But that does raise the question, how do we define what's love? How do you love your neighbor as yourself? The, as you love yourself is an interesting one. Maybe, I mean, you've probably heard the idea of being true to myself. Is that the same as loving myself? I mean, and being, being true to myself and treating others the way that I would want to be treated? Jesus said that would be a good thing. So books and films, they, they try and define love in all sorts of different ways. Generally, you can, you can understand there being a spectrum from on the one hand, raw lust, say, right through to, on the other hand, a mother's selfless love for her child. And, and love can be anywhere along that spectrum, sometimes multiple places at the same time. I mean, who knows our own hearts when we're trying to love somebody? Particularly in a, in a kind of equal relationship, how much of it is wanting to take from them, lust, and how much is wanting to give to them, it's, it's really hard to define. Um, so if love is doing the best for others, say, then how do we know what is best for others? I mean, think about it. If you love your dog, you want to feed them good things, chocolate. No, that's not loving for a dog. Chocolate is toxic for a dog. Okay, well, ducks, feeding ducks bread. Nope, not good for ducks. Feeding mice cheese. Nope, afraid not, that's, that's not good for them. Feeding cats milk. No, milk is, is, most cats are lactose intolerant. Uh, feeding children sweets. I mean, any good grandma, grandparent feeds their child, uh, grandchild sweets. Well, it's not actually good for them, as parents will know. I mean, they're bouncing off the walls. Giving homeless money. Well, I mean, the police say, if you do that, you're killing them with kindness. There was a big campaign about that in, um, on, the, on the billboards um, a little while ago. So how do we actually know what is loving to somebody? I mean, this gets a bit complicated. Even when we, when we think we're doing what's good for somebody, it might not actually really be good for them. Uh, so some people go to the completely the opposite extreme. So they say, well, maybe we're doing more harm than good. Maybe the best solution is, if you love it, set it free. You've probably heard that as well. Or love is basically not interfering with other people's choices. Just step back. Let them do what they want. Let them be true to themselves. That's truly loving. Well, think about it. Uh, this would be saying let, letting children eat what they want. Letting teenagers sleep as long as they want or sleep with whoever they want. Letting adults watch whatever they want or inject whatever they want, maybe. Letting migrants or refugees live wherever they want. Letting nature grow as it wants to, wherever it wants. Well, I mean, these, these are complicated now. 
how do you, how do you know whether that's good for them? In fact, uh, boundaries are necessary for fruitfulness. Or discipline is necessary for excellence. Restrictions are, are necessary for flourishing. It's, it's a, just a principle of life. It's the way the world works. So if you think about it in terms of boundaries are necessary for fruitfulness, uh, in, in a couple of YouTube videos I saw recently, at different times, just randomly they're connected, what, I saw one YouTube video of a sheep that had wandered off. It had been on its own for years. Uh, and obviously, you know that sheep grow woolly coats. And, and this sheep had been, it was, it was weighed down with this, this wool just hanging down to the floor. Another video was of a dog, uh, uh, one of those dogs that kind of has to be shorn regularly. And it had been just wandering around wild for a little while. And it, and it was just, it was almost ground into the ground. It was so weighed down, both the sheep and the dog. Uh, when, when they were shorn, it just released them. It was, it was really um, killing them, that this being allowed to just uh, flourish. Uh, I have a friend of mine as well, just recently, I think a couple of weeks ago, he emailed me. He's a bit unusual in his thoughts, but he emailed me to say, I've had this thought. I think trimming our hair or our beard is unnatural. I think we should just let it grow. That's the way we were meant to be. And I, my response was to him, well, do you trim your fingernails or your toenails? I mean, if you don't do that, pretty soon you're going to be unable to walk or use your hands. I mean, I, it's, it's not a very good argument, um, kind of just letting, letting yourself uh, be the way nature is designed. No, we need boundaries and fruitfulness. Uh, I actually grew up in the tropics, and there, contrary to what a lot of people think, the jungle is a green desert. It's very, very hard to survive in the jungle. You don't find lots of fruit there. You don't find lots of flowers there. It's quite rare. But if you want to find fruit and flowers and kind of uh, nourishing things, you need a garden. And a garden is very carefully tended and trimmed. If you don't tend or trim your garden, then you're not going to get fruit. Apple trees, or, or uh, particularly grapes. If you don't uh, prune the grape, uh, grape uh, vines, then they won't produce grapes or hardly anything. You have to be very strict with them. You have, to, you have to discipline them. You have to create boundaries, and that results in fruitfulness. Or in sense of discipline and excellence, discipline producing excellence. I, I think, thought about it recently in terms of poetry. I like writing poetry. Um, uh, I find out a big pentameter and, and kind of rhyming and all that sort of stuff for, for writing plays and things. But, uh, but it seems to me when, when you're using, when, when you're trying to write poetry that has quite strict guidelines, it actually allows for greater flexibility and, and creativity in, in composing the poetry. You're forced to think more carefully about the words you choose, and it results in really just beautiful distilled words. So, so more discipline results in more excellence. You could apply this also to sports. I don't know if, how many of you tried to play football without any lines. It, it just doesn't become fun. You, you lose the, the sense of, of joy about it. The, the boundaries are necessary to have a good game and to really excel in your skill. It's not just about trying to get around the other person going further and further away. It's, it's important to have those boundaries in, in any team sport, really. Pretty much. I mean, it, 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 it can be applied in various different ways. And with child rearing, similarly, you don't just give a child what it wants. The child doesn't know what, it, what is good for it. So, in fact, discipline for a child probably hurts the parent more than the child if the parent is really loving. Whether it's um, giving them medical procedures or teaching them the fact that actions have consequences, it, it's hard. But if you love your child, you will discipline your child. And I remember overhearing somebody in the cafe, and she was talking about how um, it was a group of, of friends, teenagers, and one of them was saying, oh, I wish I didn't have to go home. My mum says I've got to be back at 9 o'clock. And, and somebody else said, well, I wish my mum asked me to be back at 9 o'clock. My mum never asked me where I am. I've got, she doesn't know I, what I'm doing. It, it was actually a sign of love that the parent said, no, this is your boundary, this is your, your, your rule. So now, obviously, you can have parental abuse. You can have overly strict boundaries and, and, and discipline that goes 
above and beyond. But, but just the fact that discipline is misused doesn't mean that you should have no use of it. It just means you should have proper use of it. So coming to application, then, what, if, if we don't really know what's best for ourselves, let alone what's best for others, then it comes down to a question of who are we willing to trust to make the rules of the game, to tell us what is good for us, what is loving. And it, it seems to me the best test of trustworthiness in somebody is whether they themselves are willing to restrict their own uh, pleasures or flourishing or whatever for our sake. So where, where they put our needs above their own, where they're not, uh, they're not seeking their own benefit but somebody else's. And you could apply this in, in different ways, different examples. Uh, parents, good parents, will put the child's needs above their own. And uh, new parents learn this with a, with a baby. They're, they're definitely not getting enough sleep. They're not kind of enjoying life in that sense. Everything is focused on looking after this child, whatever it needs. That's the mark of a good parent, putting their needs sec second to the child's needs. Or a hardworking teacher. You can trust that the teacher has your best interests at heart if they are staying up late into the night to mark your, your, your essays um, and to, to check that you, you're really understanding these things. Um, that's, that's, you can trust them. They know what's good for you. Or, for example, leaders who endure oppression for the sake of their people. I mean, there are various examples of this, but I mean, famously, Nelson Mandela, who was in prison for years on behalf of his people, when he came out, he was elevated to the highest position in South Africa because he had shown that he actually, his, his needs were, were below the needs of his people. Or Gandhi, Mahatma Gandhi, similarly. Um, th there are various examples. Now, Jesus said something similar. He said, greater love has no one than this, that he lays down his life for his friends. And that, that's, that's probably fairly true. We could probably agree to that. Uh, that. That's an ultimate expression of love. However, it's interesting that Jesus himself went further than that. It wasn't just a sense of uh, laying down his life for his friends. That verse I, I, I mentioned at the beginning, Romans 5, verse 7, it says, uh, you remember... It says, one will hardly die for a righteous man, though perhaps for a good man, someone would dare even to die. I mean, it might be worth giving up your own um, life so that a good man can keep doing good. That's the whole point. A righteous man, well, there's plenty of people trying to keep the rules, but a good person, yeah, I want them to, to keep living. But it, the next verse goes on to say, but God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners as in God's enemies, Messiah Jesus died for us. Now that's quite remarkable. It's not just uh, laying down your life for your friends, it's laying down your life for your enemies. I mean, that's just raising it to a whole nother level. I mean, who of us is, is able to do that? It's not just putting, laying down your own um, needs for your child or for your students or for your people, for your enemies? That, that's, that's extreme. That, that is another level of goodness. And, and that does raise a question also, why does, that just sounds a bit weird, why, why did Jesus even need to die for us? Why, why does anybody need to die for somebody else? I mean, what, what's, what's he doing there? It's, yes, he's a good man, obviously he's, he's showing love, but just because you love somebody doesn't mean you throw yourself in front of a bus. I mean, there are other ways, surely, of, of showing love than, than dying. Well, this does raise the, the problem. If we can't meet even our own standards of goodness, let alone God's standards, our own standards of, of moral uprightness, then, uh, then how, why is that? Kind of, are, are we stuck in our inability to, to, to do good, let alone to do right? Are, are, are we limited in what we can do? Why are we limited in what we can do? I mean, we all know that. We all know how hard it is to, meet, to keep even our own rules. Okay, um, New Year's resolutions, or this term, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get up at 6 o'clock in the morning, I'm going to do two hours of exercise, and I'm going to um, uh, go to the library, and all, no, we can't do it. Even our own standards of goodness aren't enough. There's something that is preventing us from achieving the goodness we want to achieve. 
And the Bible says the problem is actually our selfish hearts. There's something about our hearts that, that is broken. We are slaves to sin. We're slaves to the bad. We want to do good, but we find there's something else at work. There's, we're torn. We're pulled different directions. We know the good we want to do, but we can't do it. We're stuck in sin. We're stuck in, in bad, in doing the wrong things. We don't want to, but that's just reality. And how do we deal with this problem of the human heart? The selfishness, it's in the heart. Well, the only solution, according to the Bible, is when a sinless king substitutes himself for his sinful people. He has authority over them, therefore he can substitute himself for them. A parent can pay for their child's mis misdemeanors. That's their, their responsibility. Um, an innocent person can pay for the guilty if they have responsibility for them. So a sinless king can pay for his sinful people, can substitute himself for them. And effectively, what that does is this death, this, this personal self-sacrifice, substitution, is the only way to break the power of sin in our lives. We know there's a power of sin. It just it drags us down. That, that death, that substitutionary death, breaks the power of sin over the heart. It also pays for the penalty of sin. We know all those wrong things we've done, that they have to be dealt with. There has to be, has to be some sort of penalty. That death paid for that sin. It means we don't have to pay for it anymore. It also heals the effects of sin in our heart, in our lives. So many things in our lives are just the result of things bad people have done to us or we, bad things we've done to other people. That, that death heals the results of sin, the damage caused by sin. And effectively, what it's doing is it's, it's giving us a heart transplant. It's transplanting our selfish heart for Jesus' good heart, his righteous heart, his loving heart. It's, it's a phenomenal thing. It's, it's, you think, how, how does this work? But it's, it's a spiritual fact. It's a spiritual reality. And those of us who have actually met Jesus, have accepted that sacrifice, have discovered it for ourselves. There is a, a substitution. There's a genuine change. There's a transformation in the heart. And you, can't, you can't explain it until you've experienced it. But it is real. And, and Jesus says, anyone who comes to me, I'm going to do that heart transplant for you. What you can't do, I have done for you. Let me take out your heart of stone, give you a heart of flesh. So this is really a message of grace. This is the unique thing among uh, all world religions. Only Judaism and Christianity have this message of God doing for us what we can't do for ourselves. Every other religion says you've got to achieve a certain standard, morality. You've got to meet certain rules if you want to be righteous, if you want to be acceptable to God. Only Judaism and Christianity says you can't do it. You need God to do it for you. In fact, Jesus has done it for us. That's the incredible thing. While we were his enemies, he died for us in order that he might turn us around and enable us to do good from the heart. So the answer to the question that we were asked today is, okay, we can recognize good, yes, without, without God, without Jesus. We can even occasionally manage to do some good, if we're lucky, it's not exactly easy, and even if we try and do good, we don't necessarily know whether it is good for the other person. It, that's possible, doing good without Jesus. But the only way of being good, of having that heart transformation, of loving others from the heart, is by accepting Jesus' goodness for us. So that's, that's my answer to the question. Now I'd be interested to hear what your thoughts are.